Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to theCUBE live at Google Cloud Next 23. Lisa Martin here with some really smart analysts. We're going to be breaking down for you in about 15 to 20 minutes what we learned today, day one of Google Cloud Next. John Furrier, our co-host and co-founder of theCUBE is here. We've got Rob Strachey is here, industry analyst with theCUBE, and Dustin Kirkland, new CUBE analyst here with us. Guys, great to have you. Right. You had loads of conversations. You got to have some free briefs as well. John, I want to start with you. Today was a slew of announcements yep. during the keynote. You guys had a, a pre-briefing of that, but what do you see, this is the first next since 2019 in person, obviously. Google's competitive strategy. What are your thoughts on it? What's their position in the marketplace? And what are their prospects as a competitor going forward? That's great, it was good, good setup. I mean, I think the number one thing walking away from 2019 to here is the stark difference between how they're presenting the content. In 2019, it was speeds and feeds, big query. They got a lot of cloud goodness, a lot of tech, um, but it was not clear how it was all worked together. And in Google fashion, they're all proud, loud and proud about their tech, which is phenomenal, and, not, and nothing to shake a stick at. This year, um, it was, they had some of those cool features, but it was more about the roadmap of the company. It was more about where they're going and why they exist. And I think they're really taking a grab at this cloud meets AI, and, and to me, they could go for this AI cloud positioning. So I think, you know, to me, I look at what Google's doing here is very, very clear opportunity for them to change the game on who they are in the cloud business to the customer, multiple customer stakeholders, and potentially shake it with some growth to change their position from three to two, um, and maybe put a shot and punch up to AWS. Uh, as I said in our opening keynote analysis, they got a line of sight on developers, the new generation, all use Google Docs since middle school. They'll naturally use the AI tools that'll come out. Uh, that's the next startups. That's the next batch of, of unicorns. That's the next batch of uh, big new brands that will emerge out of these cycles. And it's only going to be more, more another decade or two more of that, like the web had. And then they got the solutions. They're not competing with Amazon with the speeds and feeds. They're going at the solutions, which goes after Microsoft, because Microsoft made hay out of putting packages together for the enterprise. And finally, the ecosystem. If they hit that ecosystem like it's growing right now, ISVs, GSIs, and giving them enablement to make money and drive value for customers, they'll hit the trifecta. That would be, that is very possible, and that's a competitive strategy, and they're going to go all in on this, and you can see the movement, and the AI is a massive gift because Google already had chops in AI because of their scale and size, so they're lining up to match up with the number one and two players for multiple years of um, possible competition, and I think their prospects are very good. If they nail one of those three things, they're good. If they nail two, they're great. If they nail three, it's a home run. <laughs> Did you want to add something to yeah, that? Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, my observation, the last time there was a, a, a Google Next 2019, I was actually a product manager at Google launching a product, right? And so it's been really amazing to watch what's happened in four years. Uh, the big difference here this year from then uh, it's just the enterprise adoption of Google. Uh, there was certainly no talk of AI, uh, meaningful talk of AI in, in 2019. I think that's played really well to Google's strength. Strength around data, strength around search, strength around just intelligence of connecting all of those dots. Uh, and that, what that's created is an incredible delivery mechanism for you know, the goodness of, of Google, Google's enterprise capabilities into a need that enterprises have that they didn't know they had uh, that need you know, three or four years ago. Yeah. Rob, bring, bring us your thoughts on, speaking of enterprise, some of the announcements today, GKE for enterprise. Yay? Yeah, yeah. well Nay? I, I think it's nice D, that they the finally event? got there and they're more <laughs> or less killing Anthos with it. I mean, that's the new Anthos, I guess you could say. And GDC, the, around their uh, deployment in other clouds and you know, kind of hardware based approach. In fact, it's like listed on the, the board behind us here with Intel prominently focused, which is not just all their own chips. They're also partnering around this and they're also partnering with NVIDIA. I think to your point on ecosystem, this actually broadens their ecosystem where they can go to sovereign clouds. And I think it helps them with their story about how we're being better with, people's, better with people's data as well by, hey, you want to have your data on GK in somebody else's cloud, 
we're going to go and help you build that with GDC in Orange or in KPN or who knows, Singtel or some of the others around the world where they can then get that foothold. I, I think I said it earlier, this is what Outpost should have been you know, five years ago. Outpost took a very different approach going out. They, AWS was, Outpost. Yeah, AWS yeah. Outpost. When they launched and Amazon launched Amazon Outpost and AWS Outpost, that was more focused at the enterprise customer and it was a rack of 42U of server and storage. You had to buy in all on that. I think the way they're doing it, more modular, having it through the service providers in a big way, allowing enterprises to go down this path as well, very similar to what OCI and Oracle, that Oracle Cloud does, makes a lot of sense. It's kind of a hybrid model in between that, and I think GK, G, the GKE <laughs> Enterprise, I'll get that right one of these days, really it's, it, they're kind of going after and positioning with OpenShift, and you know, they've seen the success, they're partnered with OpenShift and Red Hat very deeply, uh, it's one of their platforms. I think they've seen that success and are trying to kind of emulate that a little bit more. I think they had to play catch up on some of the enterprise class features that people needed. Yeah. I'd like to add one thing to my prospects um, prediction. I'm, although I'm very glowing for Google, as you can tell, because they did a good job. And they're, I like their, the line of sight of what I said on the trifecta, I think it's going to happen. It could happen, I should say. The fatal flaw in all this, I want to get you guys' reaction, at least in my opinion, is if they compete with their ecosystem, Rob, that could be dangerous, okay? So, we had Elastic on here in theCUBE, you know, extensions, Elastic, you mentioned Red Hat OpenShift. Yeah. So at what point does Google have to stare down the barrel of a, a choice Amazon clearly made? Now they only compete in, they say only end-to-end -end Amazon only deals. Do they take a card out, playbook out of AWS, or they go Azure? Dustin, what's your reaction? Yeah, I mean, I think this is kind of the, uh, the, the fatal flaw of a Fortune, whatever, 50, 100 company. At some point, you get so big, it, like channel conflict is inevitable. Um, now, I think what, just to like, I don't know, get on, get on a high horse and, and uh, <laughs> Go ahead, with the cube, we're wish, a high horse, high here. horse here, 20 foot I, stage. You, you kind of have to hope that large companies don't take advantage of that to totally squash competition. Certainly not unfairly or illegally, right. but even just like immorally or, or yeah. unethically. Right. There's going to be channel conflict, right? Elastic is a yeah. great example who has a product, a search product, what do you know, that works well inside of Google Cloud and with Google Cloud customers. And you know, that's a place where I think Google yeah. has left a little bit of room for innovation. Um, and that's just one example of hundreds here. I mean, I would say, a third to half of the vendors here yeah. compete with Google yeah. in some way. Yeah. It's yeah. just a matter about you know doing that fairly and, and ethically, leaving room. Yeah, well, I, uh, oh, easy. Let's just un unpack that a little bit because I think that's the key word, trust. Now remember, we're, we're speculating about how it's early growing of the ecosystem. Trust is key, but enabling the partners yeah. to be successful. Yes. Right. This is going to be the key word. Like Amazon's got Redshift with Snowflakes in there and Databricks is in yeah. there. So I, they, they, have to, they have to deal with that at the internal levels, right? And make sure that they're at least putting them on an equal footing. Uh, Amazon did that, and Amazon did that, I think where they got a foul with, AWS did with Elastic, was how they were trying to you overutilize, I guess you could say, the, the Apache licensing and things of that nature. I think. It's different now with Elastic. Elastic has a very different approach. They're in, they're in Azure already, so it's not like they're not other places. The only place yeah. they're not right now is really Amazon. Yeah. So I, I think, again, you have, you know, to Dustin's point, you're going to have this anyways. I think they can manage through it. Yeah. I think they're going to have competition. Growth solves a lot of problems, the growth, right? Growth. growth solves a lot of problems. And, yeah. and they're, at the end of the day, it's consumption. Yeah. It's consumption of Google services that are going to drive. If Elastic goes and drives more search for, and by the way, Elastic's really focused at very different use cases for the majority of their yeah. use cases. So I think that will also yeah. carry a very different weight than when they're talking about Vertex AI search, for instance, which we had on yeah. earlier today. I think that's a very different focus of what they're going yeah. after. Yeah. Yeah. And the key is early on during the growth years, yeah. 
Google might not be best in class for say a feature they might have yeah. that a partner right. could do better on. That's always been Andy Jassy's answer to me when I've interviewed him on theCUBE. He always says, look, some customers want Amazon, all Amazon, yeah. and we want to let our customers be, be, be good too. Yeah. Uh, but they, they get paid on it anyway because it's cloud anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, while we're on that, that sort of startup <laughs> note, one interesting observation here, and I'll say this as a former Googler, as a Zoogler, as we call ourselves, <laughs> um, so many of these AI startups are, uh, have a ton of former Google DNA in right. them, yeah. and so That's you know right. Google expanded so much and there's this, this huge alumni network, incredible, IQ amongst yeah. you know the, those those former Googlers have spun out all over the world and planted the seeds of dozens, if not hundreds, right. of startups yeah. that I think are each of which are going to change the world. And yeah. their Definitely. research investment, by the way, deep mind and deep learning areas right. are deep. Right. Well, with, when you with look at pedigree, I mean, Cohere and uh, AI21 were on stage earlier today as customers, yeah. not as partners, yes. but as I customers, which yeah. was. I think yeah. in hearing them and the DNA they have out of, you know, specifically with Cohere, what they have from Google and Google Brain, yeah. it's, it's not the surprising. True, the true test is going to be consumption, who's consuming which cloud services, and how much of a customer are they vis-a-vis -vis the engagement yeah. and, and follow through. I will say though, in the startups, um, during the lunch break, I went out to uh, meet uh, Don Klein in the lobby, because he was up there with some, with some Cube uh, customers. Um, and the Google startup area was yep. packed. Yep. Wall to wall yep. people. Yep. And this was, these weren't plants, these were legit yeah. VCs, There's interest. legit yeah. Yeah. entrepreneurs, yeah. Uh, bankers. I mean, I mean yeah. the AI wave has just got a frothy capital market right now. Uh, it, it's, that's it's a hot. great description. It is frothy. It is frothy. But Dustin, my question for you, and you now I know you're a Zoogler, I'll, I'll be using that in my <laughs> yeah, yeah. now shows for your now, Thank on, you. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> On the AI front, why now, why AI now? Why did it just explode in the last it's year? It's something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Uh, you know, I'll date myself here and say I was taking AI classes in college in 1997 and it wasn't even like new science then. And you know, you read science fiction and it's been around since the 70s, right? Yeah. Uh, moreover, if you've ever played a game and you go into like first person play against the computer mode, you're playing against what? The AI, my kids play Minecraft all the time and they're playing against the AI and that's been around forever. Yeah. But what we're talking about here is completely different and it's this generative AI, it's the learning, it's the inferencing, inferencing is making yeah. decisions. What's changed there is a couple, two things I would boil it down to. One is this rack of machines right behind us, these incredible TPUs, tensor processing units and NVIDIA, Jensen came on yeah. earlier this morning talking about the NVIDIA GPUs. Of course, Intel and AMD have a dog in that race uh, as well. The hardware has changed. Fundamentally, it has allowed for massive scale unlike anything that we, we've dreamed of. Now you couple that with more data than you know, we've ever had in human history being created every single day, and the marriage of those two allows for that artificial intelligence to truly be yeah. intelligent. And that's different, that's materially different than a game yeah. bot deciding you know, balls right. from strikes in a, in, a, in a baseball game or something. Yeah, and I would say too, this cloud scale and the machines, and as, as SaaS come, becomes platformized, you're seeing with AI, the LLMs bring new kind of things like vector, vector database embeddings, um, the idea of extensions. We were talking to a VC from Madrona, John Truro, who's in the hallways here. He was excited about the idea that you can do stuff now with compliance built into runtime yeah. in, in these apps, and the demos are legit next level. But the legit next level things that weren't even possible in old AI, because generative AI is generating at new yeah. AI, it's not like some artifact that's sitting there that goes to a library call, you call a database and do yeah. something. Yeah. It's completely different functionality. So the LLMs and foundation models do change the game with the scale, and if you start coding that and getting some of these advances in coding, these apps are going to be completely different. But there's, there's some pretty obvious places where I think it will genuinely benefit our lives. We heard today from a guest uh, helping doctors and hospitals summarize to the patients this really complicated 
diagnosis and all that information, imagine walking away with like an automated summary yeah. from that yeah. doctor. Yeah. Uh, imagine, you know, um, uh, who here reads the terms of service of, of you know, some massive legal document? If that could be summarized into a couple of salient yeah. points, what am I agreeing to? Yeah. Okay. I need a lawyer. Yeah. yeah. And a lawyer bot, go. Well, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but I, I also think that one of the things that was missing for me today, and maybe it'll, we'll see it tomorrow, uh, to kind of back to the uh, different question, is the fact that the data layer and what they're doing in data is missing. And, and I think maybe we'll hear about that tomorrow. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping to, because I think a lot of these things use a lot of data. Yeah. And that oh, yeah. was kind of just magic behind the UI that was happening and you're making connections with extensions but to a few new companies, but that really doesn't solve that, yeah. hey, I do have data living in BigQuery. I have data in other databases. I have data on a Mongo, yeah. and so how do I utilize all of that with these services? And I, I would say, Lisa, one other thing on the data that, that's key to the why now is that the AI needs data to be available to make it smarter and useful to unlock that value, so you got to have high availability of data and make it highly available. Uh, meaning you got to have a horizontal scalability of data, which it wasn't really built for in the previous generations. No. Right. Data warehouse, silos, We didn't lockdown, have the capability. Capability, yeah. so horizontally scalable data, while making it compliant and safe and secure, yeah. is a freaking hard problem. Yeah. And yes. so that's where you start to see the, the light in these demos, it's like, wow, I, I see it, that's legit. That's making data available in real time, low latency, it's incredible. That, that, that code that gets cracked, opens up more functionality. That's why we love the data developer angle because data is now part of the app in, in, in code. Right. That was never on the horizon yeah. in data analytics, yeah. ever. Uh, or databases, so, you know. <laughs> King over something Rob said, which is what he wants to hear more of tomorrow. I want to hear a little bit more about the edge. And you know, yeah. this is Google Cloud, but we, GKE, uh, enterprise, uh, the product I was responsible for before GKE on-prem, there is, you know, Google's done a fair amount of work to go out and make some of these technologies available at the edge, at cell phone towers, at points of sale, retail points of sale. I'd like to hear a, a bit more about that, you know, over the next day or two. I, I don't know, what are you Yeah, yeah what are you here? thinking? I think, you know, I like the customer reference. I'd like to, like to see real stats on these unicorns. Um, what of the 70% of unicorns using Google? Yes. I would like to see their engagement levels and compare that. That's something they, they, I hope that they can provide. But I think it is the data thing. I want to see that developer. I want to see more developer-focused data interaction tooling. Because uh, I think the, the success is going to come from who's going to come out of the woodwork in the bottoms up open source and the coding world. I think once someone pops a use case, everyone's going to jump behind it. You just have to see an entrepreneur or some innovator go, I see a problem that's new or I couldn't get at before. I'm going to make it easier, simple, I'm going to unlock that, I'm going to make it available fast. And it's going to be lucrative, it could be a new company, it could be a new feature. I'm looking for those, those signals that'll give the developer the power to unleash yep. their entrepreneurial creativity. So, um, right now the demos they do it really, the, do, the Duet AI was impressive, so I thought, you know, that was good. I want to see that, I want to see the data developer traction. That's what I'm looking for. Data developer traction, edge, the data story, the data plays, yeah. what we're looking, hopefully, to see tomorrow, guys, from your perspectives. Yeah, this, yes. how, do, how does the data, how do all these databases work? They got BigQuery, they got BigQuery and Studio. And they're all here. There's a lot of integration. Right. Will databases become part of the furniture, so to speak, in the room? Will it just become embedded in to the application where we don't even talk about databases anymore? I mean, we, we debate about vector embeddings. <laughs> right. Like, why are we talking about that? Yeah. Yeah. That's like talking about the bark on the tree inside the bark. Right, it's like, <laughs> like, 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 bark. Like, <laughs> That's a good analogy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's zoom out and look at the, yeah. how the tree's blowing right yeah. now. I mean, the market's good for Google. Google Google's in a good position. I'm very yeah. excited for them. Yeah. Final, final thoughts, guys, in our last couple of minutes here in terms of like the words that you would describe day one, the energy, the momentum, the voices of the ecosystem that you heard on theCUBE. What, what words come to mind? I think AI, um, cloud plus AI is in my head right now because I thought Databricks did a good event where they had data plus AI, how they put data and AI together. I think Google, you know, cloud meets AI, really sets them up for the AI cloud. So to me, what, what's kept on coming in my head was, wow, Google could 
come out tomorrow and say, we're the AI cloud, and run the table with the younger generation, and that alone could be game changing. So, you know, Amazon's got to respond. So yeah. like, AWS might not be known for the 24 year old, who's graduated college and got some coding chops, you give them a, a Cody and some code assistance, yeah. they could be whipping up code and writing apps that get traction like really, yeah, fast. really fast. And that's the value, a next unicorn. Who knows, and they might not even think about AWS at all. Yeah. That's a problem for AWS, the number one player. And Microsoft's kind of stuck in that, in the middle of a, are we uh, an older company? Are we old guard? Or are we yep. young and fresh? That's right, that's a great you know, point. Cool and relevant wins the game, in my opinion. That's, yeah, those are the two to words. Middle age, right? <laughs> <laughs> I want to be both of those, cool and relevant. Cool I and think relevant. the cube helps well, with that. They're a tweener. <laughs> they're, I mean, yeah. AWS is, I think, stuck in that tweener spot right now where they tried to hard make a left turn and go enterprise from the developers who had gotten them there. They didn't quite make it across the chasm to really hardcore enterprise. Microsoft kind of stopped them a little bit there. Yeah. If they pivoting back towards engineer and the devs, what ones they pick up. I yeah. think yeah. that, to, to our point, if, if you're one, two, or three in which markets, AWS never wants to be number three in any market. In fact, they went and got rid of Honeycode, so what's going what's gonna, to what's gonna replace that as their low code, no code, yeah portion of their portfolio at reInvent this year. There's got to be something there that they yep. got to be moving to, but you had GitLab and Google, you have GitHub and Microsoft. That puts Amazon distant third yep. in this market. I don't know how are they going to leapfrog? Are they they're going to have an answer. We're going to, we're going to hear Amazon's answer. Well, are they going to go buy a face? I mean, they just invested in them. I mean, I don't, I don't know. What, what else are they going to do? Which monopoly do you want to bet on? Yeah. Amazon, <laughs> yeah. Microsoft, or Google? And right. if you're wondering the same <laughs> questions, stick around on theCUBE because you're going to find the answers. Tomorrow we start at 9 a.m., but we've got a keynote analysis at 11.30. We get to start, go to the keynote, bring you that fresh news. John, Dustin, Rob, thank you so much for unpacking day one, your synopsis, your crystal balls were spot on. We appreciate your insights, your time, and look forward to tomorrow. All right, thank you, Lisa. Thanks, thank you. Of All course, right. day two coming up for my fellow analyst co-host, Lisa Martin. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. See you tomorrow. <laughs>